Christ is ruling in the midst. I say Christ is ruling in the midst, in the midst of his enemies. My text is taken from Psalm 110. I'm going to read the first three verses. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now before Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, they overheard a word God said to Satan. The seed of the woman will bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that's all the information the human race had on anything pertaining to salvation for nearly 2,000 years. Now some have conjectured that God made man so that he could make his own choices and then he knew ahead of time what man would do and so he planned this great scheme of redemption, plan of salvation, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and so forth as a response to the human choice. Now there's a lot of problems with that. I don't aim to take it up here. I'm fully capable of arguing the case, but I'm, I'm not going to take it up here. I'm just going to say that every place that talks about God and salvation, it was all mapped out before the beginning of the world, and it was according to his counsel, Amen. not human response. If man in a morally perfect state, there's only been two, two people in the history of the world that in an adult stage were innocent. The very first choice they had to make was wrong. Now we've got to have some other kind of power enter into this equation if this, we expect this race to be ransomed. Amen. If the people whose choice was flawed brought this situation on, we surely can't expect human choice to take us out. Now I'm going to propose in this message that from the beginning, God determined to overthrow Satan by a man. And he, by this, he was going to demonstrate, as Ephesians 3, 9 and 10 states, he was going to demonstrate his wisdom to principalities and powers in heavenly places. Now, prior to man... There's no evidence in scripture that any personality on the other side knew anything at all about the love of God, the mercy of God, and the grace of God. These things were subject that had not been delineated to those principalities and powers and angelic hosts. So far as we know, there was one great moral failure when Satan fell and he didn't get any mercy and all the angels that followed him didn't get any grace and there wasn't any kind of exhibit of love toward these personalities at all. But God has traits he wants to be known. Unlike false gods, God wants to be understood. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom Jeremiah said, let not the rich man glory in his riches. 
He that glorieth, let him glory in this, and he knows me, that he understands me, that I am the Lord, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. It's Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. God wants to be known. Not like known like we know about George Washington or something like this. He wants to be comprehended to as much extent as we as the creature can you understand. There's limitations there. So now comes Jesus who's going to come into the picture. Because everything's going to be built around him. We can't build all the building around Adam stopped. Adam's race has been written off. Flesh and blood, that's what come from Adam. Cannot enter. So if anyone's going to dwell with God, there's got to be some kind of new creation. It has to be a new generation. You can follow generations up to Christ from Adam, 75 of them. Follow 75 generations up to Jesus, and they stopped. Isaiah said, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. He didn't have any progeny. But he did have, <laughs> he does have children. In the end, it says, Hebrews 2.13, Jesus is going to say the glorified Christ, Behold, I am the children thou hast given to me. It's a different kind of children, see. But he's going to have a lot of them. You may be rest assured of that. Now, let, let me take briefly a moment here to explain why Jesus came into the world. It was, uh, well, it was just, it's just marvelous. Why Jesus came into the world. It's stated a number of ways. Paul said he came into the world to save sinners. That's 1 Timothy 1.15. John 3.17 says he came into the world that the world through him might be saved. John 12, 46 says, He come into the world, and whosoever believeth on him should not abide in darkness. John 18, 37, Jesus said to Paul, uh, said to Pilate, I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. 1 John 4, 9 says, He came into the world that we might live through him. John 9, 39 says, For judgment I have come into the world. That they which see might not, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. First John 3 8 says he came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Hebrews 2.14 says he by death he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Amen. Now I'm going to declare that God had chosen to work out salvation in the midst of seemingly impossible circumstances. This is how God determined to save people in impossible circumstances, unending conflict, turmoil, opposition, warfare. I will affirm that Satan is utterly impotent against Christ and that he knows it that he has never ever attacked Jesus he has only spoken a word and it was never against Christ Jesus has never railed on Christ he's never challenged Christ He's never inaugurated a war against Christ. Why not? He knows who he is. Satan never personally confronted Jesus with anything but words. The grand temptation in Matthew 4. Demons were impotent against Jesus. Why would demons, there were demons were very prevalent they may very well be today, but there, there's such spiritual obtuseness in the world today that nobody knows for sure what's going on. But there were demons that made people blind. There were demons that made people deaf. There were people that made, demons that made people dumb. There were 
demons that made children throw themselves in the fire and while a foe went on the ground. There's demons that made a woman bowed over in her back for 18 years. All sorts of demonic activity. Never one of them jumped on Jesus. That's in his most humble state now. As, as we've declared Jesus, this was his humble state. I say the humble state. Oh, you never read about Jesus not having enough food or Jesus getting beat up at school. <laughs> oh, no. Even when he was a youth, he, did, he didn't go through the terrible twos. Not Jesus. He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. There wasn't any interruption. Even during Christ's earthly ministry, even then he ruled in the midst of his enemies. When the scribes and Pharisees took counsel to kill him, they couldn't get the job done. They tried it several times. Matthew and Mark and Luke, they record the efforts that so they determined we're going to kill him, we're going to take him out, and they couldn't, they couldn't get it done. When Jesus commanded demons to leave, they just promptly left. That was the end of the matter. Sometimes they begged, that at least don't, don't send us out of the country. <laughs> Let us stay in the United States. We're having such sick. Oh, well, that's getting something else. I guess we're we got to stay off of that. Because <laughs> there are places demons feel at home. Remember that gathering demoniac that made a wild man out of him? Ships sailed around that part of the country. They wouldn't go over there. They were afraid to. They chained this man up. He broke the chains. He, he was a howling and screaming through the night and running and cutting himself and scared everyone half to death. And Jesus Christ come over there in a boat. He stepped out of that boat. The man to whom had the keys when he planted his foot on that shore, that wild man come running toward him, and he knelt down and worshipped him. Said, I know who you are. <laughs> You're the Holy One of God. See, I'm telling you here that Jesus has always had charge. All of this, however, is only introductory to what's going to happen. Now, the psalm of which I read, there's three things to note. First was it started with sit here. Sit on my right hand. This text is mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 28, 10, I believe. It's mentioned in Hebrews 1 that this was talking about Christ, the Lord said unto my Lord, this was talking about Christ. Sit here. Then he said the second thing, he said rule in the midst. Not going to eliminate your enemies, son. At this point, you are not going to eliminate your enemies. I'll rule in the midst of your enemies. And the evidence of the rule was, and that people will be willing in the day of thy power. Now, how is salvation going to be carried out, this, this great salvation? Is it going to be in an environment of peace and health and wealth? Is TBN right? Is Benny Hinn right? Somebody's got to talk about this. All right, there's 2.5 billion Christians, at least that wear that name, in the world. Of the 2.5 billion, 555 million are members of the charismatic renewal and buy into that slop. We're not talking about a little dinky denomination, brethren. We're talking about the majority of Christendom is bought into this. And it's seriously wrong. And God's going to prove it one of these days. Their kingdom's going to collapse. Yeah. Amen. Did God 
In other words, God, this isn't the way God's saving people. This isn't even what he's doing. It's not going to be accomplished in peaceful surroundings. In fact, the king of glory thundered out one day, Don't think I've come into the world to bring peace. Don't even think that. I didn't come to bring peace. I come to bring division. I'm going to set a man at variance with his house. And a mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. And a father against his son. The man's foe is going to be those of his own house. No, it's not a peaceful situation at all. This is how, I understand, what I'm saying is, God did not ever determine to work salvation out in that kind of an environment. We have now lived to see a dramatic shift in Christian emphasis. I know some people don't like to think about this and they don't like to talk about it, but this has happened, that the spotlight is not on God, it's not on Christ, it's on man. And people are being told God wants the best for you, wants your dreams to be fulfilled, so forth. This is a complete misapprehension of the work of salvation. We now have seen the thing where we have more counselors than we got preachers. We got advisors. We have motivators. And all are designed to smooth the road. We have problem solvers. That's not how God's saving people. First place, what the problems people are trying to solve aren't the real problem. The problem is men have sinned and come short to the glory of God. And unless that situation is corrected, they're as bound for hell as anybody ever was. And salvation is about that. But how it's being worked out is the thing I want to emphasize here. Jesus did not eliminate the enemies, he destroyed their works. Come to destroy the works of the devil. You know, if you're like, you're not in Christ tonight, this thing could be resolved right, right here. Amen. We can tell you what Jesus told you to do. As soon as you start asking what you ought to do, then we'll tell you. You don't need to tell you before that. I know a lot of people preach that people ought to do to be saved before the people that really want to be saved. Jesus, let me comment briefly on the things Jesus is actually doing. How he's rule, rule in the midst of the enemies, of how he's ruling. Romans 14, 4 says, he is able to make him stand. The him there was a, was a spiritual novice who didn't know all the things that could be known, and he thought he couldn't eat meat and this sort of thing. But he, and some of the people said, we got to correct, we got to straighten that stuff out because God said that the meats were made to be eaten and, and the meats for the belly and the belly for meats. And God has commanded that meats be received with thanksgiving. Here's this person doesn't think he can eat meatless. Send the elders over there and get that thing corrected. And the Lord said, leave them alone. Start working on helping them to grow up. God make them in the meantime. God will make them stand. That's what it says. Amen. Romans 14, 4. That's not to mention that the one we're serving is able to keep you from falling. Amen. And to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. Amen. What is that? That's ruling. In the midst of his enemies. If you have not fallen, if you have not fallen, it's not because you're so smart. It's not even because you're so diligent. It's because Jesus honored your faith and your commitment by keeping you from falling. Amen. See, what I'm establishing here is what Jesus is doing is not subduing enemies. 
That's not even what Jesus is doing. Jesus, here's how he's managing things. He makes a way of escape with every temptation. Your temptations are managed. Glory to God. They're managed by the Lord. Don't think that any man's temptation is unique. There's no temptation that's common to man. Someone's went through it beside you. God's faithful. Who will with, with, with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He's a ruler now in the midst of his enemies. So here comes this temptation. Boy, it looks like you can't get it. I just couldn't help it. Oh, no, you, that's not true. There was a door of exit in that temptation. There's a way to get out. Who put it there? That's the king. That's the one that's ruling in the midst of his enemies. Now the devil's walking about seeking who may devour. You see, I wonder who I could devour in Diamond Grove. Let's go see if I can devour anybody. Well, who can he devour? He can't devour anyone. Jesus says, hands off. I can prove this to you. Satan one time went to the Lord and he asked permission to sift Sam and Peter like wheat. He got permission. Not for very long. Jesus told Simon, then he said, but, listen, but, he's just in a humble state now. We're talking about Jesus in a humble state. But I prayed for you. I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith wouldn't fail. And it didn't. Before the night was over, he'd recouped, even though he denied Christ three times. See, there's a lot of premature judgments about faith. I've been guilty of passing some of them myself, and I repent of it. God never evaluates, your, evaluates faith until the test is over. When the test is over, Amen. then he checks up on the faith. Amen. What enables a person to keep the faith through the test? It's the ruler Amen. in the midst of his enemies. Amen. The world hates, don't marvel, John said, oh, don't marvel if the world hates you. They really can't help it. They don't have any resolve. We're, we're not like they are. In a way, you can't be too hard on them. But it could put you in a tremendous handicap if you're in the minority. How are you, you going to survive a situation like that? you got more enemies than you got friends. How are you going to... The ruler, he's a ruling in the midst of his enemies. See, what I'm declaring to you is this is how God has determined to save people. He saves them by leaving them in an adversarial environment where they got a foe that's smarter than they are, more cunning than they are, more stronger than they are, trying to hunt them down. And they're wrestling against principalities and powers that are infinitely stronger than they are. And they got a law of sin and death in their members. They're toting an enemy around in their body. How are they going to survive? Why did God leave me in his state? Because he's, he is, the king is ruling in the midst of his enemies. we got uh, false prophets. Many false prophets, John said, are gone out into the world. They're all not a bunch of dummies. Some of them are shrewd. You're told, try the spirits. Because many false prophets are gone out in the world. Huh? How are you going to be successful in trying the spirits? What if you're a novice? And you don't know all the ploys of the devil. you got to bank on the king. <laughs> Reigning in the midst of his enemies. All the glories of salvation, you take all the glory, you boil them down. They're a treasure. They're a treasure. But you got it in an earthen vessel which is a big handicap. Earthen vessels 
leak. How are you going to survive having a treasure in an earthen vessel? How, how are you going to make that? How are you going to make it successfully from here to there? There's only two places, you know, here and there. And only two times now and then. How, how are you going to negotiate that treacherous terrain? He shall rule in the midst of his enemies. Salvation is about fighting inimical forces. That person to person are stronger than you are. But Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. Sometimes you have to run through rough terrain, run the race set before you. Sometimes it's up a mountain. Sometimes it's through a storm. Sometimes it's dark into a deep, dark valley. How are you going to make it through all this? He shall rule in the midst of his enemies. That's how salvation is calculated to work. He maps out the course, right smack through the enemy's land, through deserts and through drought, and it looks like you can't make it, but if you believe, you'll get manna every day, and you'll get water when you need it, and if further strength to you in your weakness, you'll never come up short of what you need. Why? He's ruling in the presence of his enemy. See, God's salvation requires that you got to wear armor. The whole armor of God. You got to put it on. You can't stand against the wiles of the devil if you don't. Satan will defeat you if you don't. You got to fight. Put on that whole armor and stand against the devil. Stand in the evil day. That's when a, that's the a bomb attack. You able to stand? How are you able to do that? Is it just because you put on the armor? He shall rule in the midst of his enemies. And you think of all the resisting that's got to be done. Got to be done. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. What if he doesn't flee? Well, you didn't resist. I'm sorry. You got to be honest about it. Satan has no answer for no. If he lays before you a temptation, the grace of God teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust, you just say, I'm not going to do that. Amen. And Satan has no strategy to offset that. Why doesn't he? Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. <laughs> then we ask not to mention Babylon the great as mentioned in the Revelation, Satan's great fabricated church, he's called a whore. God never calls the world a whore. Does he? You that know the word of God, does he? Does he ever call it, say the world's guilty of fornication? That's what he says about Babylon. It's a false church. We got to contend with it. People may like to turn their back, not contend with it, but you got to contend with it because God says, come out now, come out. Come out of her, my people. Amen. Get out of there. I'm bringing that thing down. Uh, it can't survive. There's no way. You say, how can I know? Well, that's part of working out your salvation. It's fear and trembling. I could tell you, but it's better that you find out. Dig it out. Find out what it is because God told you to come out and don't think he's playing games. When he says come out, he means come out. That's what he means. So what, how are you going to survive this large institution that you can't like, you can't like see it visibly. It's not, it's not, the, it's not like the Catholic Church. That's too easy. It's something you can't perceive with the earthly senses. But you've got to strike on a way to see it. And I know you can because he's ruling in the midst of his enemies. I don't believe the average uh, believer knows this. Now, it's a technical point here. That, that the final overthrow of Satan does not require an extended rule or process. God can make a short work 
cut it short in righteousness. Actually, he says this is the worst enemy that we have on earth. He says, and then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth. <laughs> you just say, Whew. I'm telling you the truth here. Jesus show up and take the most potent enemy, may he deceive the whole world. The deception may have been so great that if it were possible, the elect would even be deceived, Jesus said, and Jesus would come up. Well, let's take it up for the brightness of his coming. He says he'll destroy with the breath of his mouth the brightness of his coming. Listen, all Jesus has to do is show up and the devil surrenders. He quits. Do you not see why we got to get Jesus in the churches? Does anybody see this? We got too many churches that don't have Jesus in them. I can tell they don't by the way their people live when their preachers preach. Something's wrong. I know it's not our job to go around condemning everybody, and that's not what I want to do. But what I'm saying is if you're going to survive at some point, you've got to get close enough to Christ that he will fight for you. Amen. God's exalted him, therefore, to be a prince and a savior and to rule in the midst of his enemies. Now, what a... What's to be our response to this kind of information? That salvation is calculated now to be carried out in the middle of enemies. Well, for one thing, you can't have lethargy and indifference. That's got to be put away. You can't be walking around telling people you can't fall away. This is just outright stupid, and that's just the way it is. I mean, if angels could fall, come on. How much do you have to know to know that men can fall? Though so you can't adopt a theology that accepts that. Say, Jesus will take me to, even if I sin, Jesus will wake me up. Don't bank on it. There's some kind of a line. I don't know where it is. I don't know where it is. I don't want to know where it is. There's some kind of line that when you cross it, that's it. I said, that's it. Jesus said, this sin hath never forgiveness, not in this world or the world to come. I, I'm not sure what sin it is, and since Jesus didn't say, I don't think anybody else does either, but I don't want to know what it is because I don't, I don't want to get even close to that. The closer you are to Jesus, the further you are from that. So you've got to live in an alert state, see? That to, to an illogical, spiritually illogical person, that seems to be contradictory. That Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies, is able to make you stand, is able to keep from falling, and yet I've got to be alert and I've got to fight and I've got to run. It doesn't make sense to them, but see, that's how God is saving people. That's the methodology he's using. You get power from God when you start doing what God told you to do. Yeah. Then the power comes. Now let's be encouraged, brethren, to fight a good fight of faith. Fight a good fight of fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Get, get a good hold of it. I know we have eternal life. I write these things unto you, John said, that you might know you have eternal life. We don't have the whole of it. We just got like the scrapes of Eshcol. We just, we got a sample. But you got a good, good grip on it. I envision John on the Isle of Patmos. I don't know how long he'd been there when he got the revelation from Jesus. But he said, now nah, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That was a marked day in the calendar in heaven. I'm ad-libbing here. God said to Jesus, son, he says, it's time now to unveil this whole thing to John. It's time to give him the revelation. This is the day. We're going to tell him what it's all about. Jesus says, all right. So he calls an angel. All right. 
This is the time. Gotta, here's what you got to do. You go down and tell them. Now tell them what I'm going to tell you. John said, and then I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and said, and he, he got a message. He said, God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to an angel. The angel gave it to me. I'm giving it to you. See this. God, Jesus, angel, John, and the message was not diluted one bit. Amen. Now I'll give you a short synopsis of the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I'm going to tell you, I got first, I got to say a few words to the churches because the, the churches aren't ready yet. There's, there's a couple churches that are, Philadelphia is ready, and there's another church that's pretty ready, but we got five. They've been messing around. I'm, I'm about to cut them off. So I want you to deliver this message so they can get themselves ready for what's coming. He said, I'm going to. I'm going to tell you in this revelation, I'm going to tell you about a, about a beast, beast number one. And uh, he's going to be against the saints now. I'm going to tell you about beast number two. He's going to be against the saints. And I'm going to tell you about a dragon that sends out a flood to destroy the world. Now I'm going to tell you about a spiritual harlot and I know, uh, I'm ad living here. I know, John, that after you die, a lot of preachers are going to be scaring people with the beast and the dragon and all this. But I want you to tell them that when we get to the end of the book, both the beasts are gone. They're put in the lake of fire. The false prophets are in the lake of fire. The devil's in the lake of fire. And everyone that loves and makes a lie and all murders and so forth, they're all in the lake of fire. Everybody that's against Jesus lost. Why did they? He was ruling in the midst of his enemies. And while those enemies <laughs> were dominant, Jesus was taken out of people. For his name, gathered him unto himself, calling his sheep out. He said, they that are of God, hear the words of God. He's got his faithful messengers out there, heralds that are proclaiming the gospel. And those that believe, hear and believe, they'll receive the promise. They'll do whatever Jesus tells them to do. Amen. There's some people that do everything Jesus tells them to do, but be baptized. <laughs> Even though Jesus was baptized. I was preaching at a revival meeting in Red Oaks, Illinois. And there was a lady there, come from a Baptist background. And she'd never been baptized, which is unusual. Most Baptists have been baptized. And there had been preachers for several years try to talk her into being baptized. And she was just stubborn as a mule. She wouldn't. So she came to the meeting the first night. She came to me and said, Brother Blakely, don't talk to me about baptism because I am not going to be baptized. She started to walk away and said, wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> I said, you believe Jesus was baptized, don't you? We well, yeah. she yes, yeah. she said, I know Jesus was baptized. All right. Now I got a question for you. Jesus was baptized when John the Baptist tried to talk him out of it. Am I right? Now you are going to stand before Jesus someday. And you're going to have to explain to him why the Lord you said you believed in was baptized and someone tried to talk him out of it. And you let someone talk you out of it. How are you going to explain that? Well, we baptized her that week. <laughs> That's how Jesus ruled in the midst of his enemies. See, there were enemies that had been talking to that woman. They were enemies. But all she needed is she just needed like a little breakthrough of light. Yet the enemy was overthrown. So what do I say? Listen, brethren. Jesus ruling the midst of his enemies. Don't quit now. 
Don't quit now. Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. Don't stop running. Don't slow down. Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. Don't stop looking to Jesus. Don't stop working out your own salvation, fear and trembling. Don't stop perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Don't stop doing it. Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. Don't yield to temptation. Jesus is still ruling in the midst of his enemies. I tell you in the authority of heaven, three main points. Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies. If you have faith to do it, you follow the Lord and you obey him, you can look Satan right in the eye and say, who can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Amen. I'm persuaded. Neither life nor death, nor principalities, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things, present or things to come, nor anything, any other thing will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Why? Why? He's ruling Amen. in the midst of his enemies. Amen. <laughs>